start with an idea, and what does it take to get that idea manifested into a project? Or even maybe backtracking a little bit from there, where does the inspiration come from? Does it come from a lack of projects, or you need something for your reel, or you have a burning desire to say something? You create your own projects, or you're creating projects for other people? Now I've got a bunch of questions in the air, so feel free to jump in. I was going to say that's a lot of questions at <laughs> once. OK, so um, uh, let's talk about, I guess, inspiration first. Um, for me, I usually have a lot that I want to say about the world. Um, and, and, and because I'm an actor, too, I, I do want to say it with me, <laughs> with my face. Um, so a lot of times my projects will marry those two things, something that I think is important or fun or whatever it is that I would like to be in. And if I don't want to be in it myself, I know plenty of people who are actors who I would cast. So that's kind of how I start. And I'll pass it that way. Um, I think um, for me as an actor, I just want to work. You know, I gave up trying to be famous a long time ago. I just want a job. So as the environment has changed for so many of us with what's going on, uh, you got to create your own work. And I learned a long time ago that you got to write. And you have to, you know, and it's really like create your own project. And if you, you can go down the list of actors in this business that started out writing their own projects, they did one movie, now they have a, a huge long career, and they never wrote another thing. So it's that thing that gets you started and gets you going. So I started writing, and then I started writing for myself and creating those projects that way. And honestly, it's not really for me about being seen in terms of I don't need the pat on the back. I just want to work. So I want to create my work, and then I want to express myself, because as an actor, I have to express myself. Whether I'm on stage or in a movie or a TV thing, I just, you know, that drive that we have as artists, it starts there. So the inspiration is this, for me, is create something, express myself, put it on film or put it on stage. And lately it's been putting it on film. And trust me, I wanted to say this tonight mostly, just because you shoot something doesn't mean you should put it up online. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be really honest with yourself and look at it and say, you know what? It's a good lesson. I learned a lot about myself as an actor, but I'm no, I don't want anybody to ever see this. But it's a lesson, and it's, you learn it, and then you move on, and then you write something better, and then you write something better, and then you take your best work, and you put it together, and you put that out. And ask your friends to go, be honest. Don't tell me it's great, because it's me. And if they go, Frank, that really sucks. Then you go, okay, I'm not gonna put it out. And just gotta be honest with yourself. But that's where, for me, that's where the inspiration comes from, is just the drive as an artist to express myself. I, I like the first question you asked, which is, what does it take to bring a project to fruition, basically? And it's really, really hard, but the answer is really simple, which is like, don't stop until it's done. And I think sometimes that's the hardest part is, I mean, I was just complaining, I'm writing a movie right now, and it's lonely. Like, a lot of times, I think actors, we enjoy a community and having someone to bounce things off of, and you're sitting around, it's lonely. It's hard, you know, and then sometimes you just kind of have to parent yourself and be like, well, we said we were going to do this. <laughs> it's for your own best interest, you know, sweetie. I'm sorry. I know it's not always easy, but in the end, you're going to be really proud of yourself. And I'm like, thanks, mom. Um, so th it's simple. Don't stop. Like set a goal. I'm making a thing this year. It could be a piece of, he told me I can't cuss, so I'm like, I'm, I might talk slower than usual. Um, it, might be, it might be a piece of crap, and maybe you don't want to put it out, but you want to start with, I am meeting this goal this year, period, and I'm going to parent myself through it. Yeah, I would love to echo a lot of the things just said, but um, I think for me, it's two things. It's two-sided. Uh, I create 
um, it was born out of the same desire to work and to um, make opportunities for myself. But I also then felt like that was the way I was going to show um, casting and representation different facets than maybe I'm currently going out for. I really um, decided to focus on making projects where I was getting to work on roles that I wasn't getting opportunities for anywhere else. And so I was getting to show and I had that material and that content then to hopefully open up and broaden some different pathways. And then secondly for me, um, it's sort of about um, getting to work with people you like. Um, oftentimes, you know, we show up to set and we have we don't know anyone. We're you know complete strangers, and um, while that can be great, and oftentimes you walk away with a lot of new friends. Uh, I found that I get the most out of an experience when I get to work with like-minded people and people I already know. And so most of the time I'm creating projects and I'm casting my friends and hiring my friends and I have the same crew on most of the projects that I create because we have a shorthand so it's easier, it's faster, it's cheaper usually and it's definitely way more fun. How many people here have upgraded a device and it no longer worked the way you thought it should be working? <laughs> a lot of hands out there. So for me, I imagine, well, what if this gets a lot worse, right? What if our promised future means that nothing ever works like you expect it to? And so that's an ins answer to the inspiration. It was a personal curiosity and realizing that everyone faces this challenge of, of technology that's more and more required, but works less and less reliably in a lot of ways. So, once I realized that everybody was asking those same questions, I decided to set a, a story in the year 2050 and explore it. And then I think the most important thing I did, and this comes back to actors, is I said, I want to see a story I'm not seeing right now, because that excites me, but I want to see people I don't normally see on screen telling this story. So one of the big important goals for me at all stages of the process and for everything I do now has become inclusion. And I will tell you, it's great on its own, right? It's an important thing to do, but when you tell stories with people who don't normally get a chance to tell stories, you tell different stories. And so that, um, I think those are two of the most important answers to your question. And I can put the damper on things of... <laughs> Um, keeping in mind that it's called show business for a reason. Um, there is a business aspect to this. So as you're going through your you know, days or weeks or months or most likely years of developing your project, just keep in mind to leave some time at the end to come back to your union and make your project signatory um, you know, to protect yourself and all the other performers that are on your project. Um, and we'll talk about it more later, but there's you know, agreements for everything. Um, it's a, you know, kind of a sliding scale, so your um, you know, very small project for new media it has a different process than a $20 million feature film, um, but you do have to leave a little time at the end to come back and do some paperwork with SAG-AFTRA. Which is very easy. It's whatever, whatever the rumors are out there, it's like I always hear somebody, oh, SAG, it's so, they're so hard to work with. It's like, no, they're not. And I always ask them, who'd you talk to? Well, I didn't talk to anybody. <laughs> oh, well, did you go to the website? There's a website? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, you, I, my last, I just did a project last year and did it under a low budget. And I, <clears throat> I said, I'm just going to call somebody and because I don't know what I'm doing. I have always had a producer do it for me. My producer's grandfather got sick. He had to leave town and it got stuck in my lab as well. It's a good time. It's a, the universe saying you got to learn it, right? I called the girl at SAG, Julie Pongos, who walked me through everything. And everybody's, oh, it takes like three months to get your paperwork. I had my paperwork in 10 days. <clears throat> Call them. Call somebody. SAG does not want you to fail. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a feeling out there that I get all the time where people think SAG is against us. No. Without SAG, I, I'd be $77,000 in debt because I had back surgery. And I paid $4,000 because of my union. And, and to, not, to avoid your union and to not take, I'm sorry, to, but it, it's just that, it just drives me crazy with people that bitch about the union don't get involved. They don't come to meetings. So I applaud everybody in here for being here tonight because you, you wanna be involved. Go to the meetings, go to union working, go read, read just read the emails. 
Re don't delete them. Don't all do it later. Just there, it'll take you five seconds to read it. You know, read the emails, read the little things that come. Pay attention. This is your this is your union. It's not the union or their union. It's your union. And if you get involved and 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 talk to people, and we're in the business of communication, and what people don't communicate it drives me crazy. Right? Get involved. And backing up that fact that where SAG might have been a little difficult to work with or a little confusing, SAG AFTRA is very easy to work with. So keep that in mind that it's a merged union and it's a lot easier to work with. It's a different element. So keep that in mind. Here, here. And do you ever look for submitted projects or do you all look to create your own? I, I refuse to do anything that's not union. No, submitted. Have I, do I look for submitted? Oh, yeah, submitted from other people. Or do you all look to create your own? I mostly, I get a lot of people asking. I have my own production company, and I write my own stuff, and I have partners, and I have uh, peers. There's one right there, uh, always talking about working on something, creating something that we can do together. Friends, we res I respect his work. I don't like the guy, but I respect his work. Uh, you know, it's, it's a brother thing. But, it, but yeah, I, I do, I will look at a submission, but it really is more about if I'm looking for people, like, like you said, you want to work with like-minded people and you want to work with people who have the same goal. Not just because somebody has a camera, oh, we should shoot something. I, uh, I have so many of my own projects that I'm passionate about. It's really hard to um, take on other people's passions, especially if they don't completely align. I get a lot of people who ask me to either write with them or direct something of theirs, um, because I also direct. And uh, I have to be very careful of how I give my energy to the world, because most people people, even with the best of intentions, are energy vampires. <laughs> they will suck you dry if, they, if you let them. And so you have to be careful about stuff like that, I think. My manager w always wants me to be finding other projects to produce or come on board, because he, he's thinking build the empire, you know? And I'm thinking, like, I just got to finish this script. So it is a balance, but I, I have learned, you know, when I do take on other people's projects, occasionally I've been burned, and, you know, you just become a lot more picky that way. Um, so the answer is a little bit twofold for me, again. Uh, I uh, individually produce mostly projects that either I develop the idea or co-collaborate with uh, existing writers who are a little bit more adept at getting words actually on paper. Um, but uh, secondly, I also am part of an amazing film community that some people here are also a part of called We Make Is Movies. Is that why you got all those cheers? I did, yeah. <laughs> See, you guys, you got, it's built-in friends, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, and so... Through that, uh, we do take submissions um, in various different ways, whether it's through sponsored projects or we have this community pot where um, the community submits scripts and the audience, the community votes on who's going to get the budget to go make their film. And uh, I have stepped in and produced uh, a few projects that way. So. Uh, through my community, uh, I would say we all sort of co-produce each other's. It's really a group effort. Um, and then individually, I sort of have my own little pet projects that um, I tend to not really use those as open submissions for and make those sort of things that um, I'm super ex excited about. I would say the question comes down to funding. So if it's not a funded project, I'm going to reserve those in terms of energy for myself because it's going to be so much blood, sweat, and tears to get off the ground. Uh, but having said that, I think that the most successful people are those who put themselves into a community where even if you were, are working on your own self printed projects to get them off the ground, you're also taking time each week to sit down and talk through somebody's script with them or to encourage them to come to your film collective or saying, hey, I love what you do, I love your energy, I love that you're giving, how can I give back to you? So it's a little bit more complicated answer if you think in terms of the big picture and that we're all, and should it be all part of a filmmaking community. And once you've come up with the idea, the concept, and you've written a script, what's the next step? 
Rewrite. <laughs> do you bounce it off of other people first and get input and then rewrite accordingly, or do you just hash, you read it yourself and then realize, oh, hey, I've got to rewrite that? How do, what's that process? For me, definitely, it's all about um, feedback and peer review, and again, a lot of that's done through the community that um, I'm a part of. But I think then once you feel like, even, even before you have maybe the script locked, um, I sort of start assembling my team. I think I wanna see who's getting also excited about this project, who's sort of reson who's it, like also it's resonating with, and um, because it's much, as I said, easier to work with people who are like-minded and are equally as passionate about the project. So I kind of put feelers out um, and start assembling my team and my cast um, and then, uh, you know, sort of dive right into extreme pre-pro once we are uh, got that script in decent enough shape. Responding to the script question specifically, we hear a lot about the need for support, but I think one of the most important things you can take away from tonight, if you don't have this person, you must find somebody that you empower to tell you that you're doing something that needs work. Have somebody who loves you enough to say you're wrong. So my EP, Lillian, her job is not to make me happy when she gives me notes. Her job is to make me better. So that's, that's a really tough position to put somebody in, but if you can find that person, it will, almost more than anything else, ensure success. Yeah, there's, there's something to be said for, uh, how do I say this? Actors have a reputation of having egos, and I'm, that's what I've heard. So, so the deal is, is something I learned a long time ago from an editor, is watching myself on camera and being able to be objective and like looking at myself and saying, that's not good. I could be better, or whatever. So what happens when you're creating something, you, especially when you're going to put it out to the public, it's, it, Facebook alone is going to tear it apart because there's people sitting at home waiting for you to put something up so they can just, oh, I'm just going to crush this guy's dreams right now. And, and believe me, I've read it. I've read this stuff. And what it comes down to is you have to separate yourself as the actor or the writer, and you have to look at it in a way, is, is anybody else going to buy this? Is anybody else going to want to watch this? And if you don't have the wherewithal to put your ego aside and be able to tell yourself, yeah, this, we got to reshoot or we got to, this is crap, I'm not putting it up. But Alfred Hitchcock said the best quote I quote it all the time. There's three things that make a great movie. The script, the script, and the script. It all starts there and then it goes to somebody who supports you, who reads that script and says, oh my God, this has got to get made. And you got to get that team around you, like you guys are saying, and you got to get that support. They're going to go, you know what, this story has to be told. And then you, you develop this, this snowball rolling down the hill, and you get more and more people involved. And everybody's got to believe in the project. And if there's somebody on the project that's not being fulfilled, that's poison. Somebody's going to sabotage it, whether they know it or not. So you have to be very careful about what you're doing. Everything that you guys do, and I encourage you to write, write, write. Create your own world, create your own team, your own family. Find those people around you who are gonna support you, and then make sure you all have the same goal. And if the goal is to make a great project, you have a very good chance of doing that. If it's just to put something up, or you're just doing something because you're bored, it's just, that's just, it's, we have enough of that on YouTube already. Um, you. You asked about like once you have the script, what's next? And so um, to me, that question is very broad and it really depends on the type of project that I'm working on. So if it's like, let's say it's a short sketch. For anyone who has never made anything before, this is a very manageable goal for your first thing. Like a three page sketch, whether it's a sketch comedy or just like a little dramatic scene, you know, at that point, I'm like, this is just, this is something I want to make. I don't care about anyone else's opinions. I'll just figure out how to do it. So what I'll do is I'll look for a location. I'll make calls to crew. And if you don't have any crew contacts, like, well, then you know that's the next thing you have to do is, you know, reach out to people and go, I need a DP. I need a sound person. Like, those are the, you can make a, a quick little movie with just those two pieces of crew, 
right? A director of photography and a sound person. Um, and so really it just comes down to, if you wanna make your own stuff, I think you just have to be good at organizing yourself. How do you wanna spend your money? How do you wanna spend your time? And everyone else's too, because people won't wanna work with you again, especially for cheap, if they're like doing you a favor, if you're really annoying in terms of organization, like nobody has time for that. Um, if it's a bigger project, you know, let's say, um, like I just, I just shot a six episode series and um, put a lot more money into it than a sketch. The same things have to happen, but now there are more people who get to weigh in, right? Like if I'm gonna spend that kind of money, yes, I absolutely want other people to tell me what's wrong so we can fix it early instead of fix it, like, fix it in post is really hard, <laughs> you know? So you want, you want to set yourself up with the best script possible and then go through all those motions. Again, it, to me, it's all organization. That's, like, the number one thing to me. Well, you, you mentioned money again, and, and that's the pivot point. Are you doing something for no money? Then it can be as much about you as you want. But the moment you can't afford to make it, I think it's really important that everyone embrace this idea that it's okay to sell it. It's okay to sell it as in the way you sell a presentation, right? And for us, because we were making a sci-fi show that needed a budget, even though it was modest, for us, being willing to sell it meant bringing on a concept artist who we would have that concept artist take 10 trailer moments. And I think that's something that a lot of people shun is this idea of, of getting into the business of it. But truly, if you want to succeed creatively, you have to embrace that you're creating a product that has to be sold just as if you're window shopping at Forever 21 or at a bookstore or whatever it is. Uh, Forever 21 is not sponsoring me, I should say. I don't know why I said that store. <laughs> just in case you're wondering. Where'd you get that vest? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but my point is, at some point, this became something more than my own artistic baby, and I had to say, okay, what's gonna make somebody wanna look at, look at it? And so the advice I would give to everyone here, because it's accessible, is what if you took the best moments and made concept art out of them, and now you can sit down in front of anybody and bring your project to life? Because there are just as many artists as there are actors who wanna get their work out there. So that's a really, really great and easy thing to jump into to bring your work to life. And Dior, you look like you had something to say. Um, I was going to say you should probably try to find a producer should be the first thing <laughs> once you have a script. Um, when I made my first web series, I was really lucky to work with people who are right out of AFI, the film school. And so I always recommend if you have a script to contact AFI or contact, um, LA Film School, or and try to just get ask them who are your producing fellows who who just graduated. Um, they need something to do. They need something to say. I'm a producer, and that's helpful because sometimes you'll have a gang of actors who don't make good producers. Plain and simple, you know, you want someone who knows numbers and knows fundraising, and that is the career that they've chosen. And if you can catch them right as they're coming out of film school they will do that for free if they believe in your script or your project or your talent. So I would start there and then they can come on board with great ideas about, you know, I went to school with this artist who can do this or we can do an Indiegogo campaign or whatever, but they can help you with the money and they will also have gone to school with DPs and uh, grips and all these talented people who have all these skills that they're really itching to use for the first time professionally. And they might still have a student discount. For sure. This, yeah. this, is a, really. this is a collaborative art. You need the guy behind the camera. You need the producer. You need people to keep you on, on point. You need people to tell you, you know, that's not a good idea. You need people to tell you this is unsafe. Everybody brings something. And one of the things you can learn, if you ever, I long time ago, I did PA work when I was trying to make it as an actor. And I worked on that crew, and it gave me a whole different appreciation for all of those people who are working so hard to make me look good. And that takes a lot of work. So it's that thing where you, you have to understand everybody brings something to the table. And, and you have to, you have, if you don't respect it, you're not going to be successful. So pair up with people that you know. And, and the thing about, I've worked with Chapman University, and I've worked with AFI. And uh, those people are committed. And they, those students coming out of those places, they, they're very serious about what they're doing. And you can get them cheap. Chapman has a really good film school. 
Chapman, it's kind of slept on. Like everyone talks about USC and everything, but Chapman's really good too. And at what point do you start fundraising and how? When you're born. Yeah, allowance. <laughs> um, more uh, practical answer maybe is uh, sort of, again, it depends on the size of the project. So there is completely, it's completely plausible to do something for zero dollars. I mean, genuinely, it's, it's very much um, within reach. And, uh, you know, using your smartphone to shoot, using... Um, you know, things that are, you don't need a location, you can shoot in your apartment. It is very, very practical. However, if you are sort of um, ready and you've been iterating and your projects are improving and they're expanding and they're getting bigger, um, you know, I think fundraising is one of the hardest parts, I think, of the filmmaking process. It's very challenging. Um, and so I think that's sort of another reason why to get your your group, your team, your tribe together and um, pool resources, whether that's through crowdfunding, whether that's through, you know, everyone's going to save up and chip in a few hundred bucks to, you know, pay for um, some gear and crafty. Don't skimp on crafty. That's really important. Um, you know, that's another way of doing it. Um, and then, you know, from there, you can, you know, make pitches to brands. Some brands are willing to do um, sponsorships, whether that's uh, financial or in-kind donations with uh, products or gear or that kind of thing, reaching out and sort of just asking from the heart, you know, explain why this project's important to you. You'd be surprised what uh, the power of an ask can really do sometimes. So don't be afraid. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's not something that I can sugarcoat. I just, I just did a GoFundMe for a short film that I did. 93 of my friends, no strangers, gave me $10,000 in 30 days. And I, and I was going to defer. I was going to do the defer and not pay the actors and do all this stuff. I paid everybody cash at the end of the day. Wrote every, I gave everybody a, an envelope with the money that they were supposed to do. Kind of messed that up, but, but you know, I had, to, I had to talk to SAG and figure out what I did wrong. But I, they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't slap my hand. They said, yeah, in the, in the future. I also did it under my own name. What I should have done was created a, a production entity because I wasn't allowed to, um, the money that I paid myself, uh, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't report it because I was the entity. So I should have made, you know, ABC Productions or whatever. Well, not ABC, but uh, <laughs> you, get, you get the point. A little, little, a little ABC. But I should have made a name, and then I could have, I could have reported the, the money I paid myself. A lesson learned. But Julie was, she was just like, oh, yeah, you should have done this. You know, next time, call me. And I'm like, that's right. I should have called. So, but it, but it's, it's, it can happen again, but make sure, make sure you have a really good script. There's a question I think you should ask before you ask, how do I raise funds? What is this project meant to do? And I think a large number of you out there are probably wanting to showcase your skills, your talents, right? We have finally hit the era where an iPhone or your Samsung, neither of which are sponsoring me either, so I want to balance. Um, that is enough if you want to capture a great performance, seriously. I've judged film festivals and short film festivals, and I will tell you, an iPhone shooting an amazing performance wins somebody whose parents gave them $100,000 to make a really badly acted show. And I can't say it any more explicitly than that. What you cannot fake, though, is sound. I'm sure you've heard it. If you're going to spend your hundreds of dollars per day, please spend it on sound. Because, and I'm serious about this, iPhone plus good sound and an editor, if you're doing a showcase, that is enough. That's the most important thing I could say. Unless you are trying to convince a network to do a show, then that's a completely different mechanism. But it's all about what you want the project to do. I would add lighting to that. You know, if you can't see you, can't, can't see it, can't hear it, can't hear it. Those are the two, the two most crucial things I spent money on was lighting and sound. Especially if you're black. <laughs> You need lights. Um, oh, I was going to say, if you take a step back to the writing process, um, 
if you know you don't have a ton of money, you can write towards the resources that you have. So if you have a friend who owns a bakery, you're writing a bakery web series. You know what I mean? So you might not need as much money as you think. If you start out the gate, there's a shootout on a bridge, you're going to be in trouble if you're trying to raise that money yourself. That'd be free crafty too, right? Right. Now you're thinking, yeah. And if you're doing you know, crowdfunding or something like that, that's great. Keep in mind, in the state of California, it is illegal to exchange money for a job. So if you have a, you know, a promotion or reward on your crowdfunding, that is, give me $500, and in exchange for that, you get a walk-on role in my web series, um, you have broken the law, and you could get in a lot of trouble. So don't do that. I've never done that, but now I know not to. <laughs> so great. I, I we all learn. <laughs> I love the point you made. It, and, and it comes down to this, what do you have that's different or special? Um, and a lot of times we forget that there are places we came from where it's a lot easier to film. So coming from proud West Texas stock to whom I am the black sheep of the family, why are you in Hollywood? Because I love it. But they would let me come film on a ranch. And I can't get access to that there. So I think people sometimes forget that the people that, that we left behind somewhere else still love us and still want to support us and would love nothing more if we came home for a week and shot in this place you don't normally see on the average short film. Yeah, and like if, you're, if you know you're going to shoot on an iPhone, maybe it's the apocalypse and you're, you're talking into your iPhone, like use what you have so you're not shooting you know, some grand story on an iPhone. You know what I mean? It looks, it might look bad if you're writing about really rich people and they're just in your apartment shot. <laughs> Although, with I, just, I think you just described Cloverfield though, which, which was rich people shooting each other on. So maybe but there's a version of it. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. But use what you have, you know? I'm, you know, it's funny because I agree with all of this, but I also take a slightly different tactic that um, I, I'm not rich, but I will pay for convenience, right? So like, sometimes I do think it's worth raising the money to have a great DP because I've tried to shoot on my phone and it looks like crap, like for me, but it also depends on what I'm doing. I've now done enough projects that I want to be above that level of what can I do by myself versus what could I fund, you know? And so that's, that's the other part of the decision, I think, is like, what level are you at? If you're just experimenting, yeah, experiment away without spending a ton of money. But if you've done that and you're ready to level up, then I think, I think that it is worth fundraising, however that is. Um, I've done several crowdfunding campaigns, and I'll tell you, it's work, though. If you want to do that, you got you to gotta know that like that month of your life is going to be dedicated to bothering everyone you know, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so, so it just really depends on, on what you feel comfortable doing. Um, I did a project that was three minutes long that uh, got it won some awards and uh, we, we paid $70. I paid $50 for a dolly like that I was literally pushing when I wasn't on camera and then the other actor would push it, you know, going the other way and, uh, and 20 bucks for lunch. It was three people, two actors and a DP and, um, and we just traded a microphone because there weren't many lines, you know? So you can absolutely do that, like a $70 film. And the cameraman was my boyfriend's brother, so <laughs> he was free, um, you know? But I've also done films, like a short film for $20,000, you know? And, but that was a very different project with a very different intention. So it just depends. I think, I think something to take into consideration is that we all come from, none of us have met before, so I think you guys know same people, but we all come from a different place. So my, my view on how to do something may be different from, well, probably is different from everybody up here. That, that's a good thing because all of you need to know that whatever we're saying up here, it's not law. It's I did this and it worked for me. She did this and it worked for her. Uh, there's, if there was one way to do this, we'd all be living in the Hollywood Hills. So, so you got to find what works for you. And the, the, the dolly cart, I've been in a movie where we, we stole a shopping cart from the grocery store and we used that as a dolly. 
put put the cameraman in the dolly. He sat he sat in the cart with the camera, and we got great dolly shots. And we had we just had a guy pushing it while he was in it, and it looked fantastic. You got to work with what you know. Use whatever works, right? So so it's, you just got to take 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 what works. And one of the advantages I had growing up, the youngest of six sons is I have five older brothers that I was able to learn how not to live my life. So all of the mistakes that they made, I never made those mistakes. I made my own, but I didn't make any of theirs. And, you know, brothers used to get pissed because my, my dad, you know, I didn't get punished for something. Well, I didn't get caught. And I didn't get, I didn't get caught because I saw how you got caught, and I didn't do it that way. It's the same way with making film. Is you, is I could go work with, with Steve. Steve, right? Steven, but that, Steven, that's fine. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. We're just knowing close. each other for the first time. Yeah, that's, that's fine. But I could go work for Steven and I could learn so many ways how to do something differently that could benefit me. But I also might disagree with some, how he would do something. But as an, if he hires me as an actor, it's my job to do what he says because he's the director. So, but it's, it's a lesson. So go work, get a camera, go work, go shoot something, you know, shoot something you better. Play, play with, it's like play with the clay. Play with the art, the, the, the paints and the oils, and find out what works for you. And until you start doing it, I'm a much better producer now than I, am, uh, than I was 15 years ago when I started doing this. It, I was horrible. And I, and I actually won a festival, and I'm like, how did I win something? I, I just, that was crap. And then I just made a really, really good film, and I didn't get crap out of it. it was like, I, didn't, I didn't barely got any festivals. And I'm like, what? You don't know. You don't know. And who cares? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really make it for the awards. I just because I, I needed to express myself. Yes, I want the awards. You want some awards? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and I have to admit that um, Aubrey runs a workshop on equipment that you can utilize to make your projects, which is one of the reasons that I wanted her on the panel was because I was at, well, I've been at her work, two different workshops where she showed equipment, and I wanted her on the panel to talk about her projects, but I wanted you to know that she offers these workshops through SAG-AFTRA, so that it's an option for you to attend her workshops on equipment. And... Yes, mobile uh, filmmaking specifically. So uh, yeah, we've taught a, basically I've called it like the smartphone studio. Basically your phone has everything you need to uh, produce a really high quality project. Um, and so I go over the gear, the apps and best practices that um, you need to sort of get up and running and shooting on your phone. Um, and the rig itself is less than $200. So it's completely reasonable and affordable um, to start shooting tomorrow if you want so um keep look out we'll probably bring it back soon um and i think there might even be a a video version going up at some point too okay. and start practicing tomorrow and then start shooting after you talk to sag after and sign the signatory contract <laughs> oh, i because you brought it up again i do want to say how easy it was to make that happen mm -hmm. um for my sci-fi project how low budget was it well we went sag new media and what it meant was that some of the best and brightest in the business were willing to work with us because we had made the effort to make sure everyone was covered. And it's, it's interesting. I talked about it being a business. Well, when you go Sagna Media, for us at that point, it branded the production as these are real people who care about doing it the right way, even though we were small. So I just, just want to give a little shout out to my peeps from Sag <laughs> And if you want to post a breakdown on Breakdown Services that says it's a union project, Breakdown Services is going to call us to make sure it is a union project. Uh, so hmm. you know, if you want to go down that route, um, you are going to have to uh, talk to us anyway. So you might as well do it up front. Can I jump on that train really quickly? So in my community of actors, I've somehow become known as the 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 SAG after a person, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's so, awesome. Uh, yeah, people will always like, be like, you know, like, try, ask her. And um, so I always tell people, like, you know, try doing it by yourself. And if you have any questions, just call me at that point, you know, and I'm happy to help you. And literally not one person has ever called back with questions. Because I, for whatever reason, like you said, there's like this fear and so people want to ask me first, and I'm like, no, literally just like hit that button, fill it out, and if you get stuck, let me know. No one gets stuck. That's why they're here. 
there, there are people in the offices upstairs waiting for you to call. Am I right? Five days a week, nine to five. Yeah, <laughs> well, we yeah call we them. Did. Don't call me. Because it's we didn't our even union. Right, right. It's responses. our union. That's great. Like, I mean, like, we didn't even get taught how to do this. We were just exuberant. That's great. I and by that. the way, those business representatives that work for SAG after that are up there waiting to answer your questions are Teamsters Local 986. So they're also union members as well. Woo -woo. I'll also jump in. I know that some people are probably thinking about the elephant in the room when we talk about this, which is production insurance, which sometimes has created a bit of a hurdle for some people when they go to try to do uh, a SAG after contract. Um, I know of a very different ways around it, um, not around not having it, but of how to get it affordably. Uh, you know, for instance, with We Make Movies, we have a umbrella policy. So if you bring us on as producers, you can use our insurance policy to, um, to insure your project. So there are ways, don't get frustrated if you hit that hurdle and you realize like, oh my gosh, you know, it's gonna eat up my whole budget. Um, there are options out there. I know it's just not always the easiest thing to find, but um, you know, and anyone here in this room, please come talk to me. I'm happy to discuss more after this, too. Actually, now's a good time to talk about both We Make Movies and New Filmmakers LA. Uh, Larry LeBeau, who could not be here tonight, gives a shout out to everybody um, who's been a part of New Filmmakers LA. And I think you've probably heard the word community at least a dozen times tonight. None of us are up here alone. We've all made shows. We've brought them from just an idea into a series or a movie. Uh, but I'll tell you something that unites all of us is we found a community. And I think there are two great communities represented here tonight. New Filmmakers, New Filmmakers LA has a monthly festival. And it's one of the most inclusive festival programming runs you can find on the planet. From LGBTQ to age to people of every stripe, they'll do these great programs. So if you have something to say that's a little bit out of the mainstream especially, there's a festival right around the corner where you can get that up soon after completing it. And like, like these other communities, when you go to the festival and you go to the workshops, you meet people just like now. If, if, by the way, make sure you talk to the person next to you tonight and get their contact info. I know that sounds ridiculous and reductive, but if you do that, that's two more people you leave with tonight who are part of your forever community. It's, it's just that easy. It makes it even more easy when you're part of a community like New Filmmakers LA or what you're about to talk about. Yeah, so uh, We Make Movies is a um, LA-based film collective and community where we provide resources and empower um, filmmakers to make their own projects through free workshops. We meet every Wednesday night in Hollywood and read uh, scripts of new writers with our actors. They do a stage reading and the audience gives feedback. We have works in progress screenings where we screen rough edits of projects and the audience gives feedback again. Um, and then we also, like I mentioned earlier, um, have a bit of a community pot where we actually literally give out money to filmmakers to go make their projects. Um, and so it's a not only a community to provide education and resources and opportunities, it's absolutely a family. If you heard the cheering, this is it's a very tight-knit community that is so supportive of each other. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, enough because it is, as um, I think you were saying, it is kind of lonely and isolating to go out and do what we do. And so having a tribe of people that is legitimately cheering you on and not trying to stab you in the back is very, very uh, important. And so, um, like I said, we also have um, gear and production insurance and um, services like editing and DCP that uh, we provide. Um, and if you're a member, you get discounts on all of that, but all of our stuff is completely free to attend. Um, so please don't be shy and come say hello if you come out. I think there's one thing that these type of communities provide that if you're like me and you started as a poor kid in town with no connections, right? I'm not Hollywood royalty. So anything that you succeed in, if you start like that, it's because you asked or connected. These types of groups also provide discovery. How do you level up? Well, the great thing about these organizations is because there's been such hard work to create strong communities that are inclusive and doing great, notable things. Now, this is a place that agents have started to make a detour around to see, well, who's interesting? And these organizations also get calls on, I need an assistant who's gonna be on the writing team or a young up and coming director 
or who's great that I haven't seen and needs a chance in acting. It's not the end of all answers for you, but it's one more important answer. So don't forget about discovery because you can't make that up on your own. I have a personal experience with new filmmakers, um, L.A. and Larry. Uh, we entered a contest that they do. It's called the New Filmmakers L.A. On Location Project. And you make a short film about Los Angeles. Mm. Um, so this was one that I did for very little money. I, uh, we spent $800, which I know might sound like a lot, but it's not a lot in terms of what we did for the production. And we, we won the contest, and we won $60,000 in cash and prizes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, what a great return on investment, right? So, like, in terms of th that discovery, we got all of this um, stuff that we could then use for the series I mentioned, and we got a lot of notice and people who were more interested in me as a filmmaker because I had some legitimacy behind me as well, you know? So, so if you make good work and put it out to the world in th this way, like it really can come back to be so helpful. Yeah, I don't know if you know the, I think it's newfilmmakersla.com is the website. We I weren't supposed to say websites. Oh, okay. But Well, I'm I just really let that cat did. out of the bag, okay. didn't I? Great. Anything's worth a Google. <laughs> sag -Aftra has some input. Yes, so you're also part of the community that is sag -Aftra, and there's a lot of resources available to you through your union. Um, so one, uh, you know, if you're, if you're here tonight, uh, you probably figured out that the, uh, the LA Local has a great calendar on their website where they do all kinds of events like this through different committees. Um, so, you know, there's this, there's, we've already mentioned, you know, Aubrey has done uh, workshops through that, so there, there's a lot of those available to you. Then there's also two workshops that happen every month that you might not be aware of. So the, I'm gonna get them right. The third Tuesday of every month is a low budget uh, new media workshop. So staff from the television and new media department is in this room from six to 8 p.m. Um, and they go through the, uh, the low budget new media contracts and the new short project agreement. So that would be projects under $50,000 uh, per episode or per project if it's a single. Um, and that is open to members and non-members, so if you have a producing partner that's not a member, they're welcome to attend that as well. Um, the great thing about that and the next workshop I'll talk about um, is the, it's, it's a short PowerPoint, but then it's Q&A. Um, so you get to hear the questions that everybody else is asking that you may not even have realized you should be asking. Uh, so it's a really great way to, you know, make sure that you're thinking of everything you should be thinking of and meet more people, meet other producers. Then the second Thursday of every month, there is a workshop in this room from 6 to 8 p.m., um, which is actually hosted by SAG Indy, uh, which you may be familiar with SAG Indy. They are uh, a, thir they're a, a separate organization from SAG After, but they are grant funded to help producers through the SAG After process. So they host a low budget theatrical contracts workshop, again, second Thursday, um, and some staff from the theatrical contracts department will come down and they go through the short project agreement, the ultra low budget agreement, modified low budget and low budget, talk about some of the highlights of each of those agreements, and then again, answer questions for a couple hours. So another great way to, to learn more and meet other people and hear more about uh, what you should be thinking of. I want to return the favor. What should we Google for your organization? Just Google We Make Movies. Google We Make Movies. Yes. Got it. Thanks. Appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> And also, if you have any questions, uh, such as the one that you brought up, um, can I uh, auction off a walk-on in my film, and you call sag after and they say, not in the state of California. So sag after has access to answers that may seem just benign, and you call up and you realize, oh my gosh, I can't do that in California, or I can lose my entire budget. So really, if there's certain things that you need to know, go ahead and call, because I was fortunate enough to uh, go through and do a walkthrough in the offices and meet the, um, I don't know if you call them operators or assistants or what the word is, but the people who are there to assist us. And they're there with thousands of answers and absolutely willing to help everybody. So. And we get a lot of questions, so don't think because you called and asked us, we're going to recognize your voice, and then when you call to register your project, we're going to say, oh, that's the guy that wasn't going to pay overtime. We're going to get it. We do not have the, the resources to do any sort of thing like that. Um, we would much rather I don't you need, ask I don't need to questions. change my voice. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
prior to my current position, I was one of the, the auditors. Um, so I was always the person that people were told, um, ask her your questions ahead of time, because if you hear from her after the fact, it always comes with a large number attached to it. Uh, so we do have auditors and business reps and everybody available to answer your questions. And if you call and say, you know, hey, I'm thinking about shooting in you know, Cuba, and I'm gonna hire somebody for, you know, bring them down the first Monday of every month for a year, I'm gonna be able to tell you, well, you're shooting in Cuba, so you're gonna have consecutive employment obligations, so you're gonna to have to pay them for every day of the year. Are you sure you wanna do that? Um, so, you know, thing, things like that are worth uh, calling ahead and just making sure that you're not uh, falling into a trap. And if you're doing something different or we I mean, every day, s some production calls and they're doing something we've never heard of before. Uh, you know, it's, it's changing that quickly. So if you're doing something that doesn't seem to fit into the confines of what you see on the website or what you hear at these presentations, if you call and describe to us what you're planning to do, we'll tell you what's gonna work and what isn't gonna work and what contract may fit. Um, and if it's so so new that we don't have a contract for it, we'll make one, you know, we, we, you know, we, can, we can do that. We just need to hear from you in advance. Um, and you know, ideally not, you know, hey, I wanna shoot something this afternoon, here's what I wanna do. Uh, you know, a little lead time is good. Uh, we like at least three weeks in a perfect world. Um, but you know, don't, don't be afraid to call and ask the questions and uh, we're not afraid to tell you in return that's gonna cost you $100,000, are you sure you wanna do that? And you know, maybe you wanna do this instead. Um, that's what we're here for. I, I, wanna, I wanna stress something though. These were, were some complicated cases, but for me on my last couple of projects, I started very simply with, hey, <laughs> and my producer did on the other one, and it was, here's our budget, here's how many days we're shooting, here's our goals, what's your advice? And, it, and that's something any of us can do. So I, I, I don't wanna make it seem like it's, it's you know, you. An, an, an impossible goal when, if I can do it, like anybody can. And do we it. used to like so. The way that SAG after contracts were traditionally set up is the first question you would be asked is what are you doing with this project, um, and you know the, increasingly the answer is I'm doing whatever you know somebody will take it to do with this project. Um, so last August, uh, a new agreement came out called the Short Project Agreement, and this is the first agreement that really doesn't ask that you know that premise question of what you're doing with it. It's more you know is it under 40 minutes and is it under fifty thousand dollars and are you shooting it in the United States? States, and then the rule, you know, there's there's some, you know, it's negotiable rates and things like that, so it's you know, pretty easy to make. And then whatever you end up doing with it kind of determines the ongoing residuals payments or anything of that sort. Um, so that's, you know, the first foray into that, but that all came from, um, you know, staff and member committees hearing from producers and member producers and their friends that, uh, you know, we need, a, we need a different approach to this because we don't know what we're making when we start anymore. Um, so, you know, that's, that short project agreement is great. There's been nearly a thousand projects signed under that agreement since August. Uh, so it seems to be very popular and seems to be working well. Um, but it's a great option for, you know, your first or when you're just getting started. I'm going to say I, I, I've used it. And um, for, for people who are doing just like a, a short project that you're like, maybe I'll put it online. Maybe I'll go to film festivals. That's the one that you use because now, like she said, it doesn't matter which um, platform you use to distribute, whether it's on a, at a film festival or online. So um, yeah, it's simple. It's so much easier than it used to be. I think it's just a couple signatures, really. Yeah, that's it. A cast list. And I think I may have asked something similar to this, but at what point in the process should you bring in SAG-AFTRA? What's the basic, what should people leave here with in their mind as to when they should contact you when they're gonna be doing a project? Yeah, ideally you contact SAG-AFTRA at least three weeks prior to when you plan to start rehearsing, traveling, or filming performers. Um, so the, for our mind, your start date is either when somebody travels, rehearses, or films, that starts your project. So we'd like to hear from you at least three weeks before that. Um, if it's earlier than that, that's great. We're happy to hear from you sooner. Um, you know, if it's, if it's way too early, we may tell you, you know, okay, you know, go form your company first and then come back. But um, if you have a script, a budget, and, uh, you know, an idea of what you're doing, you can come, you can start talking to us. We have, you know, we'll, we'll start your paperwork then. Um, if it's less than three weeks before you plan on starting, still call us. You know, let us know what's going on. Um, we can turn things around faster. It's just we have to be cognizant of volume and you know the you know, what all is going on at that time. But we will be realistic with you. You know, if it's if it's a week or two, yes, we can probably still get you through. If it's you're starting this afternoon, well, you know, we may say, hey, you may want to consider pushing because we're probably not going to be able to process your paperwork that quickly. 
Um, and the closer you are to the start date, uh, you know, the more responsive and available you are to your business rep, the better. Um, if you are you know, cutting it close, but you say, I'm going to sit by my phone and wait for your call with the paperwork, and I'm going to sign it right away, that's going to help a lot. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever we can to make your project happen uh, with whatever time frame we have, but ideally three weeks. Excellent. And what are considerations, and I have a few of them listed, that uh, producer budget editing requirements, locations, and liabilities? And you all can jump in with any considerations that can help the people out here. What do you mean by considerations? Like that people should consider when they're doing projects. All of those things you yeah, said. That's what, <laughs> yes. So, Yes. I didn't, want to, your own I didn't want to do one by one in case each of you has like, oh, I have this. And another one goes, but I have this. So uh, that's why I just sort of lumped them. I think, I think w what Aubrey said is assemble your team. It's, it's, you got to get people behind you that are supporting you because I don't, I mean, unless it's really difficult to do something by yourself. You know, once you have your script and, you know, you got to find those people like those two right there. Uh, who love her and support her and are there for you, and they got your back, right? Yes. Yeah. So you start with something like, like right there, and then you, you go from there, because without the support, you're going to drive yourself crazy, and as Diara says, it's, it's lonely. I think it's surprising how willing artists in this town are to help people getting started. Uh, whether it's a gaffer on a TV show, who would love to do something in the two-week hiatus or the summer hiatus, or a producer who's just learning how to do a better job at AFI. Um, I say this because there's so much to know. I think the higher level question is, what don't I know? And then having people fill in those spots so they can watch your back. Because when we film, it's actually a dangerous thing. We put people in places and have them focus on things besides just safely walking, for instance, right? There are a thousand versions of that. So for me, because I know I can't think of everything, it is who do I need to find who's gonna worry about things I don't even need to worry about? So that's, I think, the very first consideration. But the second consideration is if it's your project, um, because safety is so very important, and I don't mean to sound like mom and dad all of a sudden, but um, I think we've all read the stories, is that once we start these projects, that we all take on the responsibility. Because here's the thing, if you start a project and it's your project, you are a producer. Not only that, most of us have to be producers in this town to get the word out. So assemble the team who knows the things you don't, and then keep checking in all the way to the very end if it's your project, because it really is your responsibility. Yeah, Steven, Steven Spielberg says that he's, he's not really a great director, he just hires a great crew and then he lets them do their job. So make sure you hire people who know how to do what they say they can do. Because I've, unfortunately, I've, we had a sound guy that we hired for a movie and he was in the Navy and he used a Naga machine and he knew all this stuff and we're in Topanga Canyon and all these motorcycles are going through the canyon and you know, you know it's like a rumble going through and he goes, we're speeding. And everybody, the actors and everybody looks around and goes, we're waiting on the motorcycles. And he's like, I don't hear anything. <sighs> we had to dub that whole movie. Yeah, so make sure you people you're hiring is know what they're doing. And then you gotta trust them to do their job. Yeah, and I also think, um, especially because we're talking to uh, member producers, uh, ideally having someone who, especially on the day of, can take the producing uh, responsibilities off your plate as much as possible. Look, there's always going to be fires that happen that you're going to have to step in for, but really being able to focus on being an actor on that day really, really helps. So, you know have your um, you know, line producer really be able to step in and take over so you can really and do, it, do what you um, set out to do, which is be an actor in your own project and uh, not have to worry about picking up lunch or paying crew or getting the, even the contract signed. You know, it's, it's stuff that does add up and can be distracting on the day and sort of take away from your performance and the enjoyment of it. 
Yeah, if you're acting in it, you need somebody that's going to take over everything so you can focus on the performance. My last project, I literally I, I had everything ready to go, and then I, the, on the day of the shooting, I turned it over to the producer. And I said, the only thing I'm doing today, and although I was directing still, but I had, I had blocked it all out the day before, and everybody knew what they were doing, and the camera guy and I had talked about everything, so all I had to do was make sure that it was going through, and you know, there was one point where I just wasn't hitting it, and I said, and the producer comes up to me, he goes, take a moment. He says, go over there and take a moment. And I went over there, and I got my, my mind right, and I went back in, and then the rest of the day went great, because I realized I just gotta let it go and trust my team. All these guys that come to work for a low price, and you gotta trust everybody to do their job. But it's, it's, it's difficult. But the more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it. And if you're looking at a project that's moving into the 50,000 and up kind of budget level, um, you know, that's kind of around the area where sag after starts to say, you have enough money to pay your actors something. Um, it might not be a full amount, but it's something. Um, so when you get into that world, you do have to start thinking about being able to cash flow a security deposit. Um, so sag after will hold, hold a chunk of money um, for the worst case scenario, basically, is you disappear and you never pay anybody. Um, but that money isn't used for payroll, and that's, you know, it's not something that you, you draw down from or anything like that. So you have to pay, pay yourself and your fellow actors, um, and then also fund that security deposit, which gets returned to you after production if everything goes well and you turn in all your paperwork and there's not any claims. Um, but you do need to be able to fund the security deposit and your payroll. Um, and if you're paying performers, um, you know, either because you're required or because you're on a negotiable, but you've decided to pay people, um, some of our contracts actually explicitly require an entertainment payroll house. Um, but even for the ones that don't, I'm going to overwhelmingly strongly recommend that to you uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, one is, you probably all know from being members that the rules for paying sag after performers are kind of weird, like a 44-hour work week. So you want somebody that knows how to do those calculations. Um, you want somebody that knows how to withhold taxes properly and do an itemized pay stub. You want somebody that at the beginning of the following year is going to remember to send out tax documents to everybody that you employed when you're on to the next project and you're doing something different. You don't want to think about W-2s. Um, and if you, if you don't have insurance otherwise, um, a payroll company is another way to get workers' comp insurance at a significantly reduced rate. Um, I have had more than one producer tell me that it was actually cheaper for them to go hire a payroll company and pay their actors on a deferred contract because the discount that they got on the insurance covered all of the payments to the actors. Uh, so just you know, things to think about. There's a lot of payroll companies in town that are great to work with. Um, you know, make sure you find one that knows what sag after is. That's a good start. Um, but also, there's there's payroll companies that specialize in small budget projects. Um, so you know, maybe some of the bigger ones that are you know running payroll for the networks aren't super interested in your $500 project. But trust me, there are payroll companies in this town that have done payroll for $500 projects. I've seen it. I know who they are. I'm not allowed to explicitly recommend them, but if you Google entertainment payroll houses in Burbank, you will find a number of them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's another thing to keep in mind when you're, when you're planning and budgeting. Shay, I want to um, go back one question to this idea of what you should be concerned about when you're filming. And I think one of the hardest things when you're first getting started is how do you know that you're working with the right people? And I think there's one thing you can look for if you're interviewing that sound person for the first time or a director of photography or whomever it is. Are they a collaborator? Are they asking you questions and listening to your answers? Are they going to be willing to build on your ideas? And in an ideal world, that's true of the director working with actors. It's true of the actor working with the producer. So if I had to choose one thing Will they collaborate with me? Because that's going to get you through almost all challenges. Almost all of them. Yeah, you can't have a, a DP who wants to shoot his movie. It's, you you got you to gotta make sure, if you experience that, you got to make sure that this guy's on the same page or this girl's on the same page as you. And I got to say, it's always been a guy. But, uh, but it's that thing. It, it, it ruined one of my movies. It's like he, caught, he ended up watching the, 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 uh, the day, uh, uh, rough cut. And people were going, wow, you really hate, it was a, called Blonde, it was about a blonde actress killing off all the other blonde actresses in Hollywood so she could get a job. 
And it's, it's basically a 15 minute blonde joke, but it, you know, it was, it was all these different ways this girl's killing us. And then the guy cut, the DP cut it, a rough cut, and it was, it was like, people are like, wow, you must really hate women. And I'm like, no, it's supposed to be a comedy. And I ended up having to fire the guy because he wouldn't change it. And it's just, that was, that was again, lesson learned. But that, that's such a great thing, Stephen, is that you got to find out that they're on the same page as you and they're going to collaborate with you and bring ideas, but they have to stay to your vision, that what you're trying to make. I, uh, I have a mentor who is an Emmy-winning television director, and she encouraged me to start directing because, you know, I started as an actor, and everyone was like, you got to write. And I was like, oh, I'll write, you know? And then once that started going well, everyone's like, you got to direct. And I was like, what? No. Um, <laughs> but... And I told her what I was worried about was just like not knowing certain technical things, right? Like I don't, I don't know about lenses or lighting or stuff like that. And she goes, who cares? This is an Emmy winning television director. She goes, you will learn as you do it. And so that was like the most empowering thing she could have said to me was like, look, there are a million things you can worry about, but until you actually do it, you have no idea how to fix those things, right? And so the truth of the matter is, like, even now that I've been directing a lot, I still don't know a lot of technical stuff. And who cares? Truly, it's all about having a vision so that you can say, this is, this is what I want to get across, this is what I want it to look like, this is what I see in my head, and then someone goes, yeah, okay. We got that, like, we'll do it, you know? And at the beginning, if you don't have money to have all those people helping you do that, then you do have to kind of figure out some stuff. I did a lot of stuff, do it yourself, you know? Small crews, small budget, figure it out. The first short that I ever produced, because I didn't know any better, I had 19 locations and 44 actors. <laughs> but you know what? I had no clue how hard it was going to be, so I just did it, which was wonderful because once I did that, like everything else, I was like, that's easy. We can do that, <laughs> you know? So, like, didn't I didn't know. I, honestly, and, and this is on film, but uh, we just went around L.A. and stole locations everywhere. Like, you will see the L.A. Convention Center, like, in my short, you know? <laughs> like, we're inside it, you know? I mean, everywhere. <laughs> I, sorry. Um, <laughs> like the LA Convention Center. Yes, because I want to talk watching. to you later. Yeah. Uh, it's just, as the black cloud in the room, there is an entire division of the LAPD that goes out and looks for things like that. So <laughs> we be had a cop yeah. who stopped traffic to help us. <laughs> you know, so like, look, you, you, just, you, you just have to do it. I think this is what you're saying at the beginning. Like, just do it. Don't stop yourself before you try. You will figure out what you figure out. Hopefully, like, just, you know, follow all the rules that you know of and <laughs> try to find out about the ones you don't. But at the end of the day, like, you just have to do it. And you will learn from that, and then the next one will be better. And do it as a SAG signatory. Yes, uh, and I always did that. I always, always did that. We, we shot on Hollywood Boulevard. We had like a cameraman, an actress, and like two crew members. And we saw a cop, and so we ran and hid. <laughs> and then when the cop was gone, so we came back out and we tried to shoot again, and we saw the cop again, we ran. Like four times we ran and hid from this guy. And finally at one point, the cop snuck up on us, and the cameraman took off, everybody took off, and he catches me, and he goes, look, I just wanted to tell you that you gotta stay 10 feet away from the front door of any business and um, six feet from the curb. Other than that, as long as you have a crew less than five, you're, this is a long time ago, as long as you have a crew less than five, you don't need a permit and you're fine. It took us an hour and a half to find our cameraman. He was hiding in a ladies, <laughs> ladies lingerie store on Hollywood Boulevard. And I don't know if it was because he was hiding really well or is he just liked where he found a hiding place. But there is a, some rule about the size of the crew and as long as you don't have like a tripod down, I don't know what the exact rule is. But when you're doing like little small things, you can do, you can do a lot. You can look it's this stuff up, right? will answer those questions for you. Yeah. And I guess that leads me to discuss any roadblocks. None. Just do it. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a thing, I, I, I studied a lot of new age woo woo stuff. And one of my gurus said that when you come up against an obstacle, treat it like a wave. If you guys, most of you probably been out to the ocean and stood in the waves and a wave comes in and you try to stand there and it just knocks you on your butt, right? 
So she was telling us, dive into the wave, and you'll always come up on top. And I lived here two years before I had the money to take a day off and go to the, the beach. And I remember standing there and getting knocked on my butt, and I remembered what she said. And so the next wave came in, and I, just as an experiment, I dove right into that wave head first. And next thing I know, within a fraction of a second, I was standing up like nothing happened. And I was like, wow, the obstacles aren't real unless you make them. There's nothing that we can do as artists that is impossible. There's only the will and the, ex the, the desire to go out and do it. Anybody in here can make a great movie. It's just, you gotta, you gotta be committed and you gotta dedicate yourself to it and don't let anybody tell you no. And what's really crappy about it is you'll find out who your friends are. When somebody's telling you, oh, that's crap, or that's not very good, or you should do this, you do that, instead of saying, you know what, you, that's great, I'm so behind you, that's your friend. And you'll find out that sometimes it's somebody you never thought was your friend, and then somebody you've known for 20 years is always telling you something negative. Get rid of those people. You know, I don't, talk, I don't let my parents talk to me about what I do. And, you know, it's like, they, they go, you know, why aren't you on that NYPD Blue show? It's because it was canceled 10 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, so you got to surround yourself with people who are on the same, they have the, the collaboration that you guys are talking about. you got to surround yourself with people. I mean, just sitting here tonight, just listening to everybody on the panel, I'm like, I want to know that guy, I want to know her, I want to know her, I want to know her. I have two projects in mind for you two already, and you could probably do it too. It's like, it's like I, that's my brain thinking. It's like, these are people I just met tonight, and I'm already thinking, how can I work with these people? Because I, just listening to them, I hear they're of the like mind. This is the people you need to surround yourself with, not somebody who's constantly beating you down and telling you what you can't do. And having five older brothers, that's, that's all I heard my whole life. And so I moved from Oklahoma and came to LA and lived my own life. Yeah. Therapy. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all familiar with uh, the gatekeepers that exist within this industry. Um, and I, you know, I know those oftentimes feel like roadblocks, but I, I really have found that creating my own content has really gotten around a lot of those gatekeepers. The people that say, no, you're not right for that role, or no, you, you're not ready to audition for this, or no, you can't make this kind of film. Um, it's just sort of a great way to show them that they're wrong. And um, it's also, you know, in terms of, you know, practical robots, Production is a series of putting out fires, but um, it's not, I'm not saying that to scare you or make that feel daunting, it's problem solving. And um, I guarantee you, like, there's gonna be something, the water's gonna break the day you're shooting, it's gonna flood, and you're gonna be like, this is great, we're gonna make a water world version of this script today. We're just gonna go with it. And um, it's sort of like, you know, improvising as a character, as an actor on stage. You just gotta go with the flow. And um, I, you, I'm sure, you know, you guys have all very smart people who are educating yourself here, so I have utter faith that on the day of, you'll be able to able to figure out and um, get around some of those things too, but roadblocks, I think they're, you know, more of a conceptual thing if you really just do it. You know, it's the gear is cheaper, the price point of entry is so much lower than it ever used to be. Um, gear is much more affordable. You don't need to take out a mortgage on your house in order to do a lot of this stuff. So there really shouldn't be anything, I think, holding you back. Wait, you have a house? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> that's where we're going after the yeah. panel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you can control roadblocks coming up because they're pervasive. I think the only thing you can control is is what you bring as you cross that roadblock. Um, if I had to pick the most important thing you can decide as you're starting your project, and I know for many of you it will be a personal one, I would really urge you to make sure that it's your story, a different story, a story we haven't heard before, a story that you want to tell. Because I think that more than anything else is going to get you over the roadblock. We all, all of us in this room have a detail in our lives that's unlike anybody else. And that's exciting for story because it means we haven't seen it before. And all you need to do is bring the passion to reveal that as a story. And it's your story that nobody else can tell. And this is, this is 
as basic as it gets, but I know that for me, more than any other huh, preparation, when it's two hours of sleep for a week at a time and you're trying to get this, this thing to stay together and all the actors and, and the locations and now it's raining and it's cold and the catering is, is, is late and, and because it's your mom and you, you're gonna face some hard times like that, but what gets you through is, wow, I really wanna tell this story because I think it, it should be told. So if you, can, if you can find that place, you're going to do really, really well. The problem solving is half the fun. It's like, it's, it's like art, you know, when, it, when an artist or a, a sculpture looks at a block of stone or whatever, what is it Michelangelo said that he saw the stone, he saw David inside the stone, and he just picked away all the stuff that wasn't David. And when you're making a film and you're looking at it, you can block and you can do all the things that you can, but when you get on location, things are going to change. You know, it's like, it's like I went down, I was shooting in Hollywood, I went down and did sound scouting at two o'clock in the morning behind a theater company that I belonged to, and I went and I sat back there for an hour and a half, listening, nothing. Two days later, I go back again, listening, nothing. Great, we're gonna shoot tomorrow night, it's gonna be great. 2.30 in the morning, we're shooting in the alley in Hollywood off, off of uh, Coenga, and that particular night, some guy, so the city decides to power wash the sidewalks. I had $48 in my pocket. I walked out and I just said to the guy, dude, I got $48, can you go to lunch? And, and he looked at me and I said, I'm trying to do this thing. And I said, it's, this is all I got. And, I, and it gave me everything. He goes, I can go to lunch. And he left. And we, 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 it was just the amount of time that we needed to shoot. But it, it's just, you gotta solve the problem. And thank God I had $48 in my pocket. I don't have $48 now, but I had it then. And I'd say, you know, you don't have to believe me. Everybody here has told you that the signatory process isn't that hard. And I was thinking, like, if you drove here tonight and you found your way around that giant construction pit and you parked in the parking garage, uh, when you leave tonight, you're going to have to you know, put a piece of paper in the machine and the gate's going to open and you're going to be able to leave. It's kind of the signatory process. You have to call, you have to call us, you have to give us the right pieces of paper, and then the gate opens and you can go make your movie. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's that easy. <laughs> it was very visual. That was lovely. That was, that was a little story. It was, well, inspired me. Yes. It was great. It's great. Well, at least now I know how to get out of here. <laughs> That's a reminder. Avoid the pit. <laughs> the reminder to validate. Okay, I'm going to ask each of you the same question here. What should you never do? Start on that end. <laughs> Starting with sag after. <laughs> should never do a stunt without a stunt coordinator. Like killing your actors is not going to go over well for your budget. Never fail to pause if somebody says, we'll just. I know that sounds ridiculous because you hear people say just all the time, but if it's a crew and the answer to a question of how you're going to accomplish something is we'll just, there's something missing there. There's going to be something that gets thrown out for safety or time or money. And so I would say never fail to address will just head on. Um, that's, that should be a warning flag for you. I mean, there's, it, aside from just safety things, I don't feel like there's a lot of things you should never do. Um, but I can't emphasize enough the sort of power of uh, just respect and respecting your cast, respecting your crew, and not taking their time for granted. Um, I think that is definitely something you should never do because um, unless you are working with a $20 million budget, you're probably calling in favors and those people are showing up for you and um, give them the respect that they deserve for helping you make your project into a reality. It goes a long way on set. I feel like it's just the same thing, which is never stop. You know, if you have this thing that's whispering inside you, like, you should make this thing, and then a year goes by, and it's like, you should really make this thing, you know? Then I sort of think that's like a whisper from you in the future being like, hey, get it together, you know? Come meet me up here where it's already done. Um, so I would just say never stop. 
I like these supportive people you bring to the. Pro you're like your own, your own best coach, your own best. <laughs> it's it's great advice. I love it. That's awesome. I try. I try. <laughs> well, I was gonna say never be late because that's a pet peeve of mine. I don't like to be late, and I don't like to wait on people, and I don't like people waiting on me. It's a sign of respect that Aubrey's saying is. It's, it's just wrong. But really, what I heard, it just popped in my head when you were talking, is never doubt yourself. Because as a producer or a director, and you're on set, and you're in charge, and you're leading the crew, they're going to see it. And if they see it, then they doubt themselves, they doubt what they're doing, and your whole house of cards is going to come crumbling down. So it's, it's, I can't remember who said it, but he said, never doubt yourself. Just plow through like you know what you're doing. And you'll figure it out. But if you've read, if the script is right and you've prepped and you've got everything in line, just you know, go for it. Don't stop. Go for it. But it's that that doubt is a kill, is a killer. It kills it kills art. I would say um, never let yourself get away with not assigning a deadline. Like you're all in here because I guess you're gonna make something at some point, right? So decide when that point is because then you'll work towards it. Um, I don't get anything done unless I absolutely have to, <laughs> you know? Even when it's something I really wanna do and really care about. Um, so if you're ready, give yourself two weeks. If you're not ready, give yourself six months. I don't care what the deadline is, but I think you have to have something tangible and you gotta tell someone else. Like, this is my deadline, Headlines so that they know. I have a less dumb you. answer. I, I, I just wanna say, you inspired me for something. Never think you're alone. That's what I would add. I, we actually started in a conversation. We talked about how lonely writing is. And I would say, I can't emphasize that enough. Never think you're alone. There's somebody else in this city going through exactly the same struggle you are. And part of the, I think, I hope what you're hearing tonight is that there are solutions to that. So never think you're alone. That's very true. And uh, Diara, talk about turning a short into a series. Well, it was the experience I had with American Coco, it was always a web series that I produced just um, with my now husband, boyfriend at the time, and his sister had just graduated from AFI. And I wrote this thing and I said, we should make this even if it's on an iPhone. And my husband was like, let's not put it on an iPhone. <laughs> um, and so she pulled together um, a crew of people from AFI who had discounts on equipment and all that. And we shot it over maybe seven days the first season for $3,000. I'm a little shy. I don't like to ask people for money, so it was my, in, it was my tax return, um, and I just put it all in there. <laughs> and, um, and I put it online, and I waited for Steven Spielberg to call. <laughs> and <laughs> unfortunately, um, it was at a time when YouTube was really saturated. Um, I forget the exact numbers, how many people were putting stuff on YouTube, but it was a lot. Um, and so we didn't get a call from Steven Spielberg, but we got a call from- You got someone better. Yeah, somebody better. <laughs> um, a guy named Julius Tenen, who is Viola Davis's husband, and he runs her production company. And I'm sure actors will relate to this. I had done a play many years ago for literally eight dollars a show like legitimately one time i told my brother how much i made doing theater and he laughed so much i thought he was going to die <laughs> like, like it was the most demoralizing moment of my life but i had done a play with julius the piano lesson and I had met them and they had been great and really supportive. And they called it like right away. I think we had 100 views on YouTube. People always want me to talk about how you make a series go viral. I have no idea. Um, we had maybe 100 views at the time and he said, we want to produce this. We want to come on and fund the second season. And coincidentally, at the time, ABC was doing this, ex this digital experiment 
of doing short form digital series. And so I went in and had a meeting with them and they said, we know you're doing something with Viola, we'd like to do your next thing. And I'm like, well, why don't we just all put it, she was already, she was literally on the wall in the office. I'm like, why don't we just? <laughs> um, and so they were like, oh yeah, that would be great. <laughs> So it meant that Viola didn't have to, you know, use her own money, which was great. And so um, ABC had us reshoot the first season because we had one light, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> we had one light, and um, they were like, "It's really good. Let's get some lights, you know. Let's put some makeup on people, <laughs> stuff like that." So we reshot it. And we also shot a second season. Um, I'm not good with time. <laughs> when was that? Last year? Two years ago? 2016. We did that. And um, it was a great experience to sort of re-realize this thing that I had written in my apartment in Koreatown, you know? And unfortunately, ABC Digital didn't go forward. Their little experiment didn't quite work, but it was great because I sort of just after that, got a deal to write and star in a pilot for Amazon, and that was in 2017. And then that didn't go. Um, and so then I've been writing on um, different shows, uh, Last OG and I'm Dying Up Here, and also acting on um, Last OG in this new season. So it really just, what it did was it kicked off a version of my career that was greater than me just being an actor. Um, and even because I write on Last OG, when I show up on set, it's different. It's, it's really, there's um, kind of a greater level of respect, you know? I'm, um, it's not right necessarily, but there's a greater level of respect and the director's like, oh, you write, oh, okay, cool. Um, so um, that's just been my journey and, you know, we all have different ones, but it was it was a great experience, me going, we have to make this thing. And I was, at the time, almost possessed by the idea. Like you were saying, that's kind of what pulled it through, was I looked and said, this is a hole, like this is, there's a void, I don't see this series, and I wanna do it, and I wanna be the face of it, like you were saying. And so, it really has um, just, been the single biggest changer in the trajectory of my career. I watched it. Um, I watched the first season, and it's really good. Is it still up that people yeah, can watch it? Yeah, it's still on, it's on ABC.com, and on the ABC app, and on the Amazon Fire Stick. And may I, may I add that she was nominated <laughs> it's called for American. an Emmy Award? Oh yeah, Woo! that was cool. She might not mention it herself, so I just wanted to throw that in there because I didn't yeah, think she'd bring it up, and I don't think it's in her bio. Thank you. It's called American Coco, K-O-K-O. -K -O. So I just wanted to get that in there, y'all. Yeah, that's, that's really inspiring. I mean, you're, you're basically embodying all these little nuggets of wisdom, like you brought all that together and showing what's possible. I'm, I'm really inspired. So she's all sorts of awesome, so yeah. thank you very thank much. You. She did it being shy. Well, I'm shy about asking people for money. <laughs> Not shy in general. Yeah, I mean, I get so much of it now that people are ask, people asking me for money all the time. Like, I didn't want to go to Cuba. I'm a choir. I'm like, look, I have <laughs> four nephews in college. You know, my dad just broke his crown. I can't be giving you. <laughs> So sometimes I do think in the crowdfunding tip, I think it is nice to make something first and say, this is what I made, and now can you help me get through post? Or this is what I made, and now I'm gonna make something else because I don't wanna give you your tinkering around money. If you really have something that I feel inspired by this story and you've made a whole, you know, a sample or a, a vignette or whatever of what you're trying to make, maybe I can get on board, but just please give me some money because I got an idea and I'm cute. No, I'm not doing that. And you can use the short project agreement to make a sizzle or a teaser for your crowdfunding there you go. page. It's, it's great how people want you to succeed when you've shown you're gonna put your own blood in first. 
And, and I think that's, that's true again and again and again. I like what you said there about like, just show that you're willing to make it. Yeah, my friend said something about, because um, one part of the story that I left out that people always roll their eyes at <laughs> is that my husband was already a writer at CAA. So when I made the first version, his agent was like, we want to rep her as a writer actor. And people are always like, Ugh, whatever, you know? Like, but what my friend said is like, you were pushing the car. And that's the thing is that if your car breaks down and you stand there waiting or you stand there with a sign, people aren't necessarily going to help you. But if you are out there physically pushing your car, people will stop and go, are you, um, ma'am, what are you doing? <laughs> Let me help you, you know? And so that's the spirit of it is, you may not have done a play with this person or you may not know someone in CAA, but if you push the car, a miracle will happen in your network. God helps that those that help themselves. Yeah. That's very true. Now, I, I do hope to get some of these questions. I know we're supposed to be out of here by nine, but. Frank Krim has an announcement to make that is being launched from this very panel. So tonight I'm officially launching the 40 and over film festival. Writers and directors have to be 40 years or older to submit. It can be about, the subject matter can be anything. I'm not doing a genre. I'm not doing hashtag me too. I'm not doing Black Lives Matter. I'm not doing S Trump or whatever. Uh, it can be anything. It can be all those things, but what we're looking for is quality stories written by people with life experience. Not saying 20 year olds ain't got no live experience, but we're, we're really trying to do a niche here because I know so many writers and I see a lot of people, I'm not saying there are a lot of 40 year olds in here, but I'm just, I, there's the, old, the, the crowd is older than I thought they would be, but it's, a sec, it's just a, it's an opportunity for people who may have not gotten a chance and, you know, there's a lot of festivals, and I just went through the festival circuit this past year, and my movie was about a, uh, an insurance agent who gets uh, abducted and beaten and tortured for being a spy, but during the interrogation, they find out he's, he's not a secret agent, he's just an insurance agent. <laughs> so there's a lot of insurance terms in the thing, and the guy's trying to sell him a policy to get out of being killed, and there's a lot of people that, and I also actually have, I got my insurance license while I was writing this. Uh, there's a lot of people that, that are under, under 30 have no idea what an annuity is. They have no idea what a retirement plan is. They, they, don't, they don't know what insurance does. And so I talked to people in these festivals and there were people, then there were a lot of millennials who were making the decisions. And I'm like, well, they don't get my movie. And I would, get, I would get the weirdest responses from the film. Oh, it's really great, but it doesn't fit in our festival. So my festival is any subject matter. The actors can be any age, but the writer and the director have to be 40 years old or, or older. And uh, we're September uh, 20th through the 26th at the Lemley NoHo uh, in, on Langersham in the NoHo Theater District. And it's our first year and hopefully it'll be successful. We, uh, the website should be up in the next day or two. Uh, and we'll be on Film Freeway exclusively. And, um, and if you, got a, if you got a film, shoot it and get it in before Ju, uh, July 20th. So with all the information, the, the film site, the, the website is 40 and over, the number 40 and over film festival, or find us on Film Freeway. And, and we'll see what happens. And that's being launched exclusively from this panel. So there you have it. Submit your films. And I am in the unique position to have had everyone on this panel who some were previously uh, found themselves booked and unable to be on the panel, all of a sudden made themselves available for this panel. And so I just feel elated, blessed, and uh, just completely excited that you shared your journey with me and with everyone in this room. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>